I am um, Amina Sayyid, and uh, I'm the director and founder of um, the other festival, Pakistan, and the founder of Karachi and Islamabad Literature Festivals, and uh, the uh, managing director of a publishing company called Lightstone Publishers. And uh, it is my great pleasure and honor to be talking to Namita Gokhale, today, and I would like to thank the Lahore Literature Festival for organizing this session. Um, Namita Gokhale actually needs no introduction, but I would like to um, speak about her a little bit. She's a writer, editor, publisher, and festival director. And she's the author of about 20 works of fiction and nonfiction, as well as of a play. Her debut novel, Paro, Dreams of Pakistan, was published in 1984, Dreams of um, Passion. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, Paro, Dreams of Passion, that was published in 1984 when she was in her 20s. And her latest novel, The Blind Patriarch, was published last year. And this is uh, what we will be talking about, among other things today. Namita is a co-founder and co-director of the Jaipur Literature Festival and its international editions and the Jaipur Bookmark. I have had the pleasure and privilege of um, attending and speaking at the Jaipur Literature Festival in Jaipur and also attending the um, Jaipur Fe uh, Literature Festival uh, in London. They were both mesmerizing. Uh, Namita, um, as you know, J JLF is also known as the Kumbh Mela, being one of the biggest festivals. Uh, Namita has also uh, curated a uh, hundred episodes of a television program called Kitab Nama, Books and Beyond. She has been conferred many awards, namely the Centenary National Award for English Literature by the Assam Sahitya Sabha in um, Guwahati in 2017, the Sushla Devi Literature Award for her novel, Things to Leave Behind in 2019, and the Sahitya Academy Award in 2021, also for Things to Leave Behind. Uh, I think um, Navita could not attend the ceremony for the Sahitya Academy Award because it was when Jaipur Literature Festival is being held. Yeah. Um, she's also closely involved in the Bhutan Literature Festival and Mountain Echoes, and is the a director of Yatra Books, a publishing house which specializes in translations. Um, so Namita, I'd like to um, actually begin by um, um, talking about the uh, 20 books, I think that's the right number that we have written. There is so much diversity of themes ranging from social comedy, I mean, such as in um, Paro Dreams of Passion or Priya, to mythology as in Mahabharata, Sita, the Book of Shadows, uh, history, folklore, tradition as in things to leave behind, romance as in mountain echoes, and of course, family saga and the pandemic as in the blind matriarch. So how do you manage to get such detailed information and you know, research on such a wide variety of topics and themes? Amina, thank you for that sweet, nice, generous introduction. It has been a privilege to be friends with you and to work with you around so many things over the last so many years. Um, the fact that all my books turn out often different from each other has also been a deterrent sometimes because if a writer has a consistent uh, profile in their interests, it makes them easier to categorize and also to grow in that stature. But I think I'm uh, often pushed by either obsessions or curiosity or uh, e each journey has to be, the book has to provide some questions which I want to answer and which I'm trying to answer through that process. And um, yeah, they are. So therefore, sometimes the slightly bizarre humor and social comedy, sometimes the, the sadder, tragic thing, but the one thing that has held it all through is my um, deep commitment to the Himalayas and to Himalayan identities. But uh, 
Well, I think just an obsessive person who needs to keep working on something, like so many of us. I don't know if that is an adequate answer. Absolutely, uh, Namita. I think really one has to be driven. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, one has to have this passion to achieve what you have achieved, really. It's, um, it's quite incredible. And actually, that leads me to my next question is, how do you manage to wear so many hats and to do so many roles in your life as editor, publisher, author, festival director? Um, it's, it's quite remarkable. I think that one of the reasons why I'm able to do so many things is that uh, I have been blessed, fortunate, very, very, very lucky in associating with some extraordinary people who have made the task easier. And often the credit for so many things I do doesn't go only to me, but to so many of the people who we collaborate with and do things with. The Jaipur Literature Festival, there's William Dalrymple, he puts in so much. There is my dear friend Sanjoy Roy, who's the producer who puts in so, so, so much of multi-faceted uh, inputs into every aspect of the festival. There's a great team there. In, in, in my writing, I've done collaborative writing with Dr. Malashri Lal, and that has helped me a lot. So in, in everything I do, there's been a huge amount of support from other people. And if you uh, are working with somebody who knows their strengths and their weaknesses, and you know your strengths and your weaknesses, then the collaboration becomes easier. And if the ego clash can be kept to a little bit on a lower key, then one can yes, do it. Yes, absolutely. Um, well, uh, Namita, I think I must tell you that I first attended the Jaipur Literature Festival in 2009. Mm. And I was so inspired by it that that actually, uh, it really inspired me to do, to organize a Karachi Literature Festival. I do remember that. Uh, so, uh, which I did in 2010. And as you know, now these literature festivals have become a movement in Pakistan and mm. they are in every, almost every town and city across the country. So a lot of kudos to, to I you and your team. That S.R. Faruqi Saab had uh, attended that first Karachi festival and how glowingly he wrote about it. And those early days of the Jaipur Lit Fest got us so much uh, collaboration, affection from so many places. Just now in the Jaipur Lit Fest, there was a book that came out from Nepal called Karnali Blues. And uh, he wrote also about it and uh, Buddhi Sagar. And he also mentioned that it was that year in 2011 when he first came to the Jaipur Fest that he realized that he could do it. So I think somewhere all these Jaipur Literature Festival editions and the Karachi Literature Festival editions, they just lead to a little more self-belief. We, we realize that, uh, yeah, we can, uh, do the writing we can read when we see other writers when we connect with them it, it just leads to a, a different sense of security yes absolutely um so um namita coming uh, back to the blind matriarch the book is an absolutely fascinating read i couldn't put it down uh but for for our audience, I, I should just say a few words about the book. It's a family saga of a joint family told from the view um, of a blind grandmother living on the top floor of a rambling old house somewhere in Delhi, uh, which she shares with her two sons and a daughter. Uh, one of the two sons is married, so he lives uh, there with his wife and son. You know, it's not exactly a joint family because they have separate apartments in the same building on different floors and they have uh, separate kitchens. But yet it's a joint family because they see a lot of each other and especially during the pandemic, um, I think they, uh, they visit, each, uh, they visit um, the mother, um, uh, Matangi Ma, almost every day. Um, but you know, they're closely connected and um, especially, as I said, during the pandemic when they're housebound. So the novel explores a multi-generational, multi-hierarchical, somewhat dysfunctional, but yet a close household of, middle, of a middle-class Indian family living in Delhi. So do you envisage the book as a kind of a metaphor for India today? 
Well, um, I would call it an extended joint family, perhaps. Uh, and yes, for sure, I, when I wrote it, I was writing about a particular family, but uh, it began in my mind uh, with an image of an old woman on the top floor of a house living there alone. And that's where the whole story came from. And the rest of the flaws and their stories uh, sort of led from that. Um, yes, I do see it as a metaphor. You know, the ex I see the joint family and the extended joint family as a metaphor for India, because uh, uh, there is, uh, we are, uh, I, Pakistan also has uh, joint families and extended families, and, and the sense of family, and the, both the dysfunctionality of those families and both the functionality of those families, both the joys of those families and the sorrows of those families are a unique part of the Asian experience. Because at one level, um, the individuation uh, of the people within them is slightly uh, held back because the, everybody is living for the larger community of the family members as well as themselves. And so there is some degree of suppression, some degree of rebellion. But at the same time, um, there is a, a deep sense of emotional security that comes up in difficult times from these same families. I mean, I have grown up in a uh, joint family. I live in a joint family right now. And it, it's been an enormous uh, source of um, security and inspiration for me. And if I carry on uh, somehow, when you ask me, how can I wear so many hats? One of them is because I do live in a joint family where one can always hand some duty over to somebody or the other. But uh, within that, I mean, the nature of the joint family is changing in India. And then I found when I was writing this book, I began it when the pandemic had not yet begun. It was just about to begin. And uh, once the pandemic began, and I was beginning also to proceed with the narrative, I realized that things had changed within that joint family. Um, everybody was forced into contact with each other. So they had to um, examine their own roles and to relate to the other people in a different way. And, and somewhere that uh, figure of Matangi Ma, who could somewhere be looked at as Mother India almost, um, as, as a forgiving, loving figure somewhere, uh, sometimes blind. And this metaphor of blindness is very much a part of Indian myth from the figure of Gandhari in the Mahabharata onwards. In fact, the Hindi translation has just come out and it is beautifully translated as Andhari because Andhari rather than Andhi something just gives it a different feel. So uh, the book, you can't faithfully ever sort of say X is equal to Y is equal to Z. But somewhere this joint family is a mirror of all the other joint families and all their dilemmas and difficulties, maybe in a, in a gentler way than maybe true in many cases. I don't know. Yes, absolutely. And I think this is something that will be understood across South Asia, um, the concept of the joint family, which you have so beautifully shown. Uh, you know, with all the pressures and uh, the advantages and disadvantages. Um, um, you know, I was um, thinking about, um, of course, your love for mountains is there in all your books, especially your trilogy, the Himalayan trilogy. Uh, but even in this book, The Blind Matriarch, which is set in Delhi, um, towards the end of the book, uh, Shanta, the daughter of the blind matriarch, she and Matanji and um, Lali and uh, Shanta's uh, pets, uh, the cat Trump, I think that's a hilarious name, and the dog Dollar, uh, they moved to Pine Cottage in Raniket uh, before the second wave of the pandemic. Um, and this is actually um, where you know, they, they spend their days at that time. And I think Samir, the adopted son of um, the elder son is also uh, helps them settle in. 
So I know that you've spent a lot of time in Pamao and of course in Nenital. Uh, but is that what makes your relationship and your commitment to the mountains so strong? Because it's, uh, it's there in all your books. Um, at one level, I feel as though the mountains have forgotten me, even if I have not forgotten <laughs> them. Because ever since the pandemic began, I've not been able to go there and connect the way I used to because of various pressures. People were not well in the family, or I myself was ill, or the roads were closed, or there was a lockdown. And everybody else seems to have gone and spent long periods of time in the mountains, but not me. And um, But uh, here I want to diverge for one minute from what you said uh, about the joint family. And I want to say that uh, the most important part of the joint family for me is to have young people grow up in an intergenerational background. And that young man you talked about, the adopted son, Samir, coming there to settle in his grandmother and his aunt. Um, in my own experience, the, the children or the young people who grow up in joint families grow up with a, a much, much, much larger degree of empathy and understanding and also negotiation skills because they know how to deal differently with Dada, with Dadi, with Nana, with Nani, with Mossi, with what they just learn how to do it. Whereas children in, in single families who are sort of locked up in their rooms watching television, they don't learn any of these very, very important skills that can help so much in doing so many uh, very important life negotiation. So I, I'm, that I think is one of the greatest uh, assets of the joint family. And also the older people in a joint family never feel quite so lonely or neglected or lost as they do in other situations. About the mountains, I don't know. I, I feel good in mountains everywhere. I hope I get a chance to visit Murray sometimes. And, uh, but at this, I love to go to Boulder. I love the Rockies. Uh, I, I love Scotland. I love the mountains. But uh, Nenital, it's it's more to do with just such a deep uh, attachment to my childhood and the small uh, Kumauni Brahmin community of which I was a part. It was a very peculiar community because there were so few of us. And we were all so deeply related to each other that it was in fact like living in the mother of all joint families. It was like, even now I keep meeting people who were part of that web, though they are all over the diaspora now. And I think the family is a metaphor in any situation, anywhere. It is, uh, I mean, it can be politically, it can be as a nation. Uh, the nature of that, the bonds within that really define uh, the structure of that dysfunctional or functional family. And they are very dysfunctional families. This is a matriarchy, we must remember, but they are patriarchies and they are aut autocracies and they are some very, very tyrannical figures within uh, some joint families, as many of us may have known from our um, rec memories of grandmothers or grandparents telling us about the terrors of the past. So. Yes, absolutely, I agree. But you know, I find that even in Pakistan now, there was a trend when young couples would move into their own flats as a nuclear family. But I think then they realized the issues, you know, with both parents working. And I find that in some cases, they're coming back to the family homes. I'm so glad to hear that because it leads to a more compassionate, more complete people. My daughters, I have two daughters, and they were fortunate enough to always have had four generations around their lives. When they were growing up, my grandmother was alive. So there was my grandmother, my mother, me, and them. And now there's me, there's their children, them and me and my mother. So, so it's it's a real blessing to to have four generations to relate to. Doesn't come all the time to everybody. Yes, it is. It's really a blessing. Um, you know, I find that there are a lot of paradoxes um, in your book, um, the blind matriarch. I mean, for example, uh, Matanji Ma is is blind and old and weak, um, and yet she exerts a strong influence. Her presence is always there throughout the book. Sometimes it reminds me of, you know, waiting for Godot, um, that, that strong presence across the house, although she doesn't leave her own uh, flat. Um, 
but you know you can sense her presence across the extended house to household and and then she has a lot of inner strength although you find that she hasn't had a good life uh, her husband was actually uh, you know he used to hit her uh, but she was strong enough to have uh, kept her confidence and faith in herself and she also you also gave her extra sensory powers i mean she sensed that bird out in the in the cotton um, red cotton tree the same bird you talk about same bird wool uh, cotton um so here is a, a very weak person i mean a blind person exerting so much strength uh and at the same time you know the the, the fam family is dysfunctional but they also very close i mean shanta her daughter is bringing her food every day she is dropping off laddus to her brother's uh, flats there's also and then shanta also says that i know that um, uh, my brother uh, surya will support me if i'm ever in trouble so there's this closeness also so it's really i mean how would you comment on the paradoxes yeah. in your one is the paradoxes about the relationships between the people in the family but first let me talk about the paradox of her strength within her seemingly weak self and i feel that for one generation uh, the generation before many even in my generation and i hope it continues in future generations that even if the circumstances and the social social situations uh, make for weakness for women uh, they even if they are vulnerable even if they are targeted within them they have such a core of absolutely invincible strength which which comes partly from a sense of duty and which partly comes from they having taken so much nonsense from so many people that they have become resilient by knowing when like a boxer i don't know what the term for it would be but they know when to duck and when to punch you know they, they just uh -huh. a different sort of survival skill and uh, as in this uh, matangi ma knows when she can assert her strength when she has inherited some money from somewhere she doesn't let her husband touch it and her um, partly her strength from comes from the fact that she has held on to that money which had she given it over to her husband to uh, manage for her uh, i can imagine her from being in a even more uh, terrible situation than she was but uh, matangi ma has um, a deeper touch of intuition within her and i think that is a symbol for me of the fact that when we don't rely just on rationality or on our immediate understanding but when we can just look um with closed eyes almost uh, when we can look at the deeper inner meanings of things we get a different level of strength and and surely she is spiritual surely she is intuitive surely she is blessed and uh, her kindness and her generosity uh, is a blessing to the family and that's why through the most difficult situations they are able to hold together because of her generosity and her teaching them somewhere to uh, even though the uh, one son and his wife do have the impulse to want to do things themselves and, and that's yeah. there in every family around uh, asia i think yeah. there are some who hold on to less some who hold on to more but i have to share with you that after i wrote, i wrote this during the pandemic i wrote it in real time we were all locked up and i was writing about the things i was seeing around me and when i finished the book it came out a long time later and i read it and i said oh my god who's going to read this book it's a book where one old woman is making laddus as the high point of the whole novel nobody will read this but and i was i said okay now it's done it's done it has a nice cover let's see but at the same time when people read it they remember their own childhood in it they, which, whichever generations even young people would recognize their own grandmothers in it or their own uh, um, those themes of family i've often written about grandmothers i've written gods graves and grandmother was one of my early novels and and somehow no grandmother i was deeply influenced by my own grandmother though she was no way like um, matangiba so i don't know i mean i just wrote this novel because i was sitting at home and i was trying to structure my time and writing frantically and reflecting the life around me so somewhere the story of this uh, woman and the people around her seeped into it and people read it and enjoyed it to my utter surprise 
I'm glad you appreciated it and you found oh, some virtually contemporary Pakistani families as well. And the yes, whole... I mean, I saw the synergies in it. Mm -hmm. um, but Namita, you know, I find that your women characters are, are very strong. I mean, for example, you said yourself that um, Sita had more, you found Sita more interesting because she had more agency than um, Draupadi. Hmm. Um, so, I mean, could you be uh, classified as a feminist writer? Sure. I'm not at all sure if I could be classified as a feminist in the, because the word has so many connotations and contradictions within it. I, I believe in women, but I also believe in men and I also believe in humanity. And I find it somehow difficult to think that um, we can just exclude uh, the masculine point of view or the masculine um, difficulties. I mean, it's not as though men are not in a society like India. I'm sure many feminine uh, achievers have a greater degree of privilege than uh, many um, men. It could be down the class or the caste hierarchy or so many things. And I feel uncomfortable just dumping uh, men out of the picture. But at the same time, I believe passionately in women. And I, I do think at the same time that every man has a woman inside him and every woman has a man inside her and that there are so many genders inside all of us clashing to be expressed, which in fact is happening in the whole movement to more and more and more genders. I mean, somebody said there'll be 28 genders by so year. I don't know, but mm -hmm. it's, it's uh, I, I mean, this binary of male and female, men and women, um, it, it's a primary one, but I don't know, I mean, uh, uh, for me, my when I see the mask, the masculine is as important as the feminine. I think, but the distortions within the masculine, which happen every day and everywhere, because more strength has been associated with the masculine in uh, last few thousand years, those are distortions, and those every woman who wants dignity has to fight those. But that doesn't mean, I mean, there's somewhere I'm in, un, uncomfortable with, of course, I mean, Gloria Steinem, all these people, they all stress that feminism is equal dignity to men and to women and to every member of the human race. And But there is so much happening around the genders that I really need to understand who is a woman, who is a man, what makes me a woman, what makes me a man, at the moment of death, is it going to matter if I am a woman or a man? Where is the fundamental humanity that crosses across gender for sure? Uh, Absolutely. And I think our minds and hearts are similarly, I mean, you know, it's not a male heart or a female heart. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, cities play an important role in your, in your books, Jaipur in your latest book in Jaipur journals, De Delhi, Kumau. Um, so are they an inspiration for you? A sense of space, a sense of location is, is very important to me because ev ev I, I feel that every place has its own presiding spirit and it's different. The mountains are different, but the mountains are different day to day. The, mountains of the summer months where tourists forming do not have the same energies as they do on a cold winter night. Though these days they're tourists during the cold winter night also. I think a city like Delhi during the lockdown was completely different from the city when it opens out. So I, I, I believe that uh, I believe that I do try to write the spirit of a place um, not in a lot of words and descriptions, but even in the actions, motivations, and lives of the characters who inhabit it. I don't know if that makes sense. Yes, right. Uh, so, um, Namita, Namita, what is your routine in writing? Do you have a set place or a set time when you write, or do you write when the muse visits you? 
See this table where you see me. I mean, I, there's a table in front of me, and then there's a window after that. Um, this is where the papers pile up. So this, I, I wouldn't call it my desk. I'd call it the. I mean, it's just a place where, which is always a mess. And then I, I really it sounds very very silly, but I write lying in bed. That's what I find most convenient, <laughs> and where it comes to me most easily. And I used to write on an iPad. I gave up on the laptop. I gave up on the various things. And I began on an iPad. And now I'm doing a friend of mine wrote a novel of 270,000 words on her iPhone. I was astounded. Mm -hmm. she, yeah, she did it. And I said, Kurtalo. And I have recently written two articles completely on my iPhone. And I'm not sure if it works because it's sort of quicker and handier. But at the same time, the attention which you give when you write by longhand is different from the attention when you go directly to the iPad or the iPhone or the keyboard. And uh, ideally, I, I like to write uh, on a notebook in a double lined space so there's place for corrections. And then I like to type that out because that typing out is like a first edit. Uh, how does it work for okay. you, Amina? How do you do it? Well, uh, you know, I, I wish I were a writer like you. I'm not, but whatever little I write, yeah. Um, actually, uh, I do it on my laptop. Straight I can't you. do it lying down. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But um, uh, you know, uh, in one of your interviews, you had said that um, a Jaipur Literature Festival is your first priority, and uh, I think you use the word back burner uh, yeah. for your writing. And I think you said that JLF has colonized you in a way. Uh, so again, you know, JLF is such a social ro uh, role in a way you're in touch with so many writers and authors. And writing is a very lonely job. Uh, so how do you do both jobs so successfully? They're so different. You know, my dear, I said that many years ago. That was when I had taken a conscious decision to put my own writing on the back burner because I felt whatever I had to contribute to the world of literature was more effective through um, these lit fests where I could promote and position and platform Indian writing, South Asian writing, Asian writing. It was more important to me. But in the last three or four years, I've had a change of heart. I'm getting older. The Jaipur Literature Festival, uh, I, I hope that we'll make a legacy. There'll be many more people after me who will direct it, who will guide it. Already the younger teams are doing more and more and more there. And uh, as time is limited, there, I know that there are three or four books to, I do want to write uh, at some stage. So I'm looking for uh, to correct the balance a little. But at the same time, you know, uh, and I, the, the call of the Jaipur Lit Fest is more immediate. But at the same time, if I don't keep writing, the sense of satisfaction I feel when I've struggled with words for half the day is, is different. So I am managing a precarious sort of poise between these two lives still. But I think I'm returning more to my own work and my own writing. Though I thought after I finished The Blind Matriarch that I don't want to do any more novels for a while, maybe ever. I want to do short stories. I've done one, I may work on another. Uh, and I want to write books, general books, but I don't know if I have the energy or the strength to carry such a huge amount of other people's lives and their dilemmas and the contradictions in my head all the time. It's a huge burden and weight to carry. And women, people grow older, sometimes uh, maybe they're better for short stories than for very long novels. You never know. Yes. Uh, and Amita, I, you know, I often meant to ask you, I, I know that um, your uh, maiden name was uh, Namita Pant. Yes. And uh, that um, Begum Rana Liaqat Ali Khan was also from Pamaun. Yes, and, indeed. Um, and I think related to her name was also Irene Sheila Pant before yes. she got married. So she would was, you like to tell us about your yes, connection uh, with her? She was and uh, the book that you organized. Well, uh, Begum Rana Liaqat Ali was a extraordinary figure, very fondly uh, remembered in the mountains, which were her home. And uh, 
the the great women that we hear about sometimes there's not enough homework done on them so the future generations forget about them i was very very keen uh, to do a book around her sometimes i just take a sankalp in hindi sankalp means i take a vow that i'm going to do something about this but unfortunately i did not have the capacity to write research uh, visualize that book so i asked uh, our friend Puna Mayub and Deepa Garwal, these two women, one from Pakistan, one from Almuda, from the very same sort of environment where um, the Begum was born. I asked them to write the two parts of her life. Her life was almost, I think she lived 88 years, if I'm not mistaken, and it was 44 and 44 between India and then Pakistan. And uh, this woman whose life crossed situations, religions, uh, the whole uh, energy of nationalism at the same time as a dedication to uh, very uh, hu humane issues as well as uh, this fierce feminism. She, she was clearly an extraordinary person and I wanted to do my homage to her. And this book, after asking them to write these two, I wrote introduction. And uh, I do hope someday a biopic will be made on her because I think we, we need to know people whose lives, whose dedication straddles different situations and who manage uh, with such grace and dignity to do their many roles in life. Yes, I just absolutely. feel I met her ever. I think it was a commendable effort and a, a, a great uh, read, the book. Yes. And I think we need role models. Yes, we all need. In yeah. India, there's been a lot of conversation about how there are very few role models around. And um, I think one of the reasons is that um, the word role model is got merged into somehow an Instagram influencer or something, whereas that is a much shallower interpretation of what you try to do. Uh, I'm sure there are a hundred million role models around us in this world. It's just that they don't rise to the top of the visibility curve to be seen and admired enough. Yes, absolutely. It's very sad. There's so many unsung heroes yes. and heroines. Uh, Namita, I meant to ask you, uh, is there, uh, you know, Jinnah's um, mentor, um, Gopal Krishna Gokhale. Yes. Any relationship? Uh, no, no direct family. relationship. My late husband was uh, Gokhale and he uh, for five generations, they had had only one son each. So my daughter Meru Gokhale carries the name, but they, uh, we don't have any Gokhale relatives. But Gopal Krishna Gokhale was known within the family because it's a small Maharashtran Brahmin community and uh, deeply admired. And I also deeply respect and admire what I knew of that generation of uh, freedom fighters like Upal Krishna Gokhale, like uh, Tirak. So, but no, there was no relationship. I see. So it's a very distinguished uh, surname, which I've got through marriage and I'm very proud of it. Yes, well, I know that uh, Jinnah really mourned his passing in 1915. They were very close. Um, as you know, I was thinking of, um, uh, I read about Vikram Seth yes. uh, saying that uh, he, when he went to visit his mother in Himachal Pradesh, I think she was the chief justice of the high court. Yes. And he would lock herself in her room, in his bedroom over there for three or four days. He'd lock himself because he was writing his book. And his mother would get worried because she, uh, you know, his room wouldn't be cleaned or mm -hmm. so one day she just walked in with a maid to clean his room. And he got very upset. He said, uh, mother, all my characters have run away. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it does anything. Do you have to have complete privacy when you're writing your books or do your well, characters uh, run away? Well, uh, Vikram is a friend and I completely identify him with his mother's dilemma because I knew her well too because she was a great friend of my sister-in-law's Sunanda Bhandari who was also a judge in the high court and 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 uh, I am not like Vikram because I do not have the same uh, male privileges of privacy 
<laughs> in a family where my mom peeps into my room every half an hour to see if I'm okay. And and she it's very sweet. My mom's 86, but she looks after me as though I was about 16, you know. And, <laughs> but, but I do, just like Vikram, resist having my room cleaned when I'm writing. It's, it's odd that you should say that because, I mean, I've just told the people who clean my room, uh, uh, you know, we, we have quite a lot of stuff and there's no reason why the room shouldn't be cleaned more. I've told them do it every two days because <laughs> I said, this air conditioner on, there's no dust here. And the reason is because I have so many papers piled up in, in so many precarious slots around this slightly insane room. I mean, my room looks as though I'm living in a bookshelf, which maybe I am very untidy bookshelf that I do resist. My characters haven't run away yet because um, I carry them around with me like a piece of knitting wherever I go. So maybe they're <laughs> intrusive. I may go out for a dinner party trying to, with my lipstick on, trying to look very much a part of the social world. But inside me, I may be carrying these four or five oddball characters who will not let me respond to other people. So uh, yes, when uh, one is writing a novel, one is carrying those characters around and they inhabit the inner life, the mind of people like me. I don't know how many writers are able to really switch off. And uh, in, in Rajasthan, which is so close to me, there are, I always find this metaphor that in Rajasthan, they have these pillars across the landscape. And the reason for these pillars is that those women who are bringing matkas of water from some well or some bauli, then they are carrying them home. Sometimes they get tired. So these pillars are placed for them to take off that matka and place it there and then do something and put it back. Because I guess it's easier than actually putting it on the ground, which is uh, mm. still or whatever. And sometimes I wish for authors there was a sort of a pillar where we could just unstrap our novel and just put, put it back safely when one has finished. And that's one of the reasons I've said, can I write a novel again? Because of course the last one was pretty painless because it was written in um, real time with very few uh, characters. But uh, a novel like Things to Leave Behind or something which has more history, more characters in it, it's a lot to carry around in one's head and their fierce fights, their, their everything. I mean, you're carrying so many other lives inside you that sometimes you don't have time for your own life, which frankly, I'm not deeply interested in my own life at the moment. <laughs> There, there, uh, there's no obsessive character in my head. Now and then some character wanders in and I write a few lines thinking, do I want to begin the story? But there, my, my room, this room that is, I resist cleaning up is full of half begun short stories. So I'm waiting for that novel idea or that story or that narrative that will obsess me again. I don't know when that will happen. Meanwhile, I'm working on two other books, but they are more structured. Hmm, that's uh, well. That's really a beautiful uh, story, you know, about those pillars that are put up across uh, Rajasthan um, to, you know, save women's backs. Um, you know, I was fascinated by your book, um, the, the the first book, um, Paro. Yes. Um, um, I think, you know, it's had a very long life. Yes. Book. I mean, it's been so long, and yet. Uh, it's doing so well, and it's um, and then of course there's another one following it, and that's quite remarkable, I think. Um, it's almost forty years, and what surprises yes. me most is that uh, it's as a social comedy. Social comedy is very easy to age; it becomes the jokes you lose the joke. So either India hasn't changed, or strong women like Paro haven't changed, but it's just reaches out to generation after generation. Lots of people have told me it's their favorite of my novels, even people who've read it for the first time or people who are reading it for the nth time. I love the fact that um, it has survived, uh, but um, I don't know what the quality in that book is that it's, is it a strong central character or is it just the things about India that have not changed. I can't make out. I wrote a sequel and the sequel was nice, but it never had the same impact. 
Whereas uh, Paro Dreams of Passion, my first novel written when I was 26, published when I was 28, has been a companion through all these years of writing other books. Maybe yes, it's remarkable. It was luck. <laughs> I mean, different generations have read it. I think it's really, it's become a classic. They um, read it and they look at me strangely. They see this old lady with gray hair and they said, you wrote that. <laughs> it's quite funny. <laughs> <laughs> But when you wrote it, you were probably the same age as Paro. Then, yes, but maybe that's the strength of the book. Yes, that's maybe whatever the reason. I'm so glad you remembered Paro. And yes, it is continuing its journey to, as I say, to uh, amuse, if not to, um, to amuse, it entertains. But it, uh, I don't know, it gets people laughing. And actually, it's remarkable that you've also written a book for children, the, the Mahabharata, the Penguin Mahabharata. Uh, I've written uh, for a younger for audience. For children. I've written the Mahabharata for young readers, and that was, uh, I didn't know the Mahabharata so well. And there, when I wrote it for children, one had to simplify the vocabulary, keep to the main storylines, and yet keep the sense of it. And so I didn't cut out the gory parts, the death, the war, the hurt. I left them there for the children because I realized children do not like sanitized texts. But from that came another book called Ghatotkach and the Game of Illusions. And that is a book about time travel where a young child, again in the mountains, um, by some accident gets into time travel in a time warp and goes back to the days of the Mahabharata. And I personally think it's, it's a good read. And uh, I, someday maybe I'll, I'll carry that series further with another story or something. But I mean, at the moment, I just don't know what I'll write left. I'm sp uh, next, I'm spinning round and round, wondering what it is that will obsess me. Because there are lots of minor obsessions, but nothing that's taken over every bit of my life. Namit, uh, would you like to read from The Blind Matriarch? Well, I have my copy here. Yeah, but but I haven't okay. asked anything to read. So uh, let me think for a moment what to read. Okay, I just, the simplest is to read the first one and a half pages. Can't go wrong there. Yeah. Or maybe I'll read this and I'll read a little bit in the end and then they can edit out what they don't want very quickly. Right. Uh, this is the sort of the prologue. It says the present uh, I hope you can see it. The, 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 see mm -hmm. the yes. The present, the past, the dark, the light, then and now. It was all blurred in her heart, in her mind's eye. Outside the window, on a branch of the old neem tree, the barbet was singing. To hey, to hey, to hey, to hey. Was it just last year that they had found the bird wounded? lying on the pavement below the red cotton tree. It looked defenseless, awkward. It had not quite learned to fly. It had a large head, a long beak, green wings spattered with brown. Lali had looked after the bird, helped it to heal its wings. And then one day it had flown away. She could hear Surya's deep voice, softly reading a poem aloud. He had not gone away, he was there still. The past and the present wilt. I have filled them, emptied them, and proceed to fill my next fold of the future. That's the prologue, and then it goes on into the complicated story of the family. And then in the last page, maybe, and only for a night, Shantabua Samir said, this is Samir who has come after his grandmother Matangima has died. My friend Dhruv's brother is coming to pick me up tomorrow. We are going for a trek high up in the mountains. A trek, why now, I asked concern, but I knew what was driving him. There are some things a man must do alone before he gets married, Sami replied. I want to go as high as I can to see things from afar. This country, this planet, the night sky. This country, I said reflectively. Mother India. I choked up with tears, not of sorrow, not of joy, just exhaustion and anxiety and 
despair. Samir ignored my tears. He bent down and kissed my hand. Mother India, he said, Mother India. You remember that poem that Surya was so fond of by Walt Whitman? He recited the lines softly as though to himself. Past and present wilt, I filled them, emptied them, and proceed to fill my next fold of the future. I remember the lines too, and Surya's gravelly voice. I contain multitudes, I whispered. I am large, I contain multitudes. And, and that really is about the contradictions of the countries we inhabit, the history that they carry with them, the span of so many years, of so many languages, influences, dynasties, everything. There is continuity and there is change. There is change and there is continuity. And uh, this soil, this zameen that we belong to, we watch it change, we feel worry, we feel anxiety, but we feel belief in our roots, not only here, but everywhere in the world. And, and that's what family is about. Thank I, you. Actually, I must applaud your reading. Uh, thank you. That was wonderful listening to you. Um, and uh, I think uh, I've just been told that the time is up. Wonderful. So like thank you. Time has passed so quickly, we've not even noticed it. Thank you for your very skillful and engaging questions. Thank you. And I really enjoyed your answers, and I've learned so much. And thank so you very we, much, LLF, for organizing. Hope to meet very soon, Lahore, yes, New Delhi, I, somewhere. Absolutely. I still remember our drive back from Kumaon to Delhi. I remember that <laughs> so well. You know, every time I go there, I think of you and I think of Goavas because that's one of the things I thought, think of Alka Pandey, Goavas. And uh, I keep thinking, Amina Bad bhi hona chahiye. Ek. <laughs> <laughs> and, it was a memorable trip. Thank you. Yes, yes. All the best. Amroha, I think Amroha was uh, what we were searching but could not find, right? That's right, yes. Okay.